like to thank ScholarShare Speaks, who is our co-presenter and made this evening possible. Um, I'm really excited by our speaker tonight because for the first time ever, the museum is going to be open on Mondays, starting next Monday the 10th through August 26th. And this is going to give you seven days a week to put Suze's great advice to practice here at the museum. So I hope you will join us even more this summer. Um, and now I'd like to turn over to Elizabeth Rieke, who is the director of the Museum Center for Childhood Creativity, who will introduce Suze. I love Suze's book, especially this time of year. For all of you who are parents, and any of you who happen to be a teacher and a parent, you know this is just a really, really hectic time of year. And um, Fed Up with Frenzy, which is a Time Magazine uh, top 10 trend uh, book is all about how to slow down and reconnect. And this time of year is particularly important as the school year winds down and people are so busy uh, and moving into summer is that perfect time to figure out how to reconnect with your family and slow down and particularly do that in nature. Um, Suze Lipman is a uh, wonderful um, parenting and family expert. She is the social media director for the um, uh, Children in Nature Network, which is another philanthropic organization that goes out and works around the world toward the mission of reconnecting kids with nature. And we're so excited to have you all here tonight to hear from her. The book is full of incredible ideas. Um, it's a very hands-on book rooted in um, research about how kids develop and why being outside is so important for our children's development which is, of course, what we do here at the Museum Best and what we at the Center for Childhood Creativity espouse to all of the teachers that we work with and the parents that we work with. And so um, I hope you enjoy tonight, and please join me in wel welcoming Suze to hear about this great event. Come on. Hi, everybody. I'm very glad you're here. Uh, I want to first thank Elizabeth for that beautiful introduction. And I want to thank Karen, and I want to thank everyone at the Discovery Museum and the Center for Childhood Creativity who have been so warm and welcoming to me. And I want to thank uh, ScholarShare Speaks for their sponsorship of the evening, very generous. And I want to thank all of you for all the beautiful conversations that we had in the hour that led up to today. I found out a lot, a, a lot about your passion for getting kids into nature and a lot of the passion that we share. So I hope to give you some great ideas tonight. Uh, and I also want to say how thrilled I am to be here. My daughter is now 17. She's a high school senior. And when she was in preschool and the beginning of elementary school, we spent so many beautiful, memorable days here at the Discovery Museum. We have so many warm memories. So I'm really just thrilled to be back here and speaking to all of you. So summer is coming. Are you excited? <laughs> Sounds like it. Well, hopefully this talk is going to... Uh, ignite some of your excitement for getting outside. I'm going to share ideas about how you can enjoy nature in your own home, here at the museum, and out in our local beautiful nearby nature that we're very fortunate to have. So I'm going to let you in on some of the latest research about the vital importance of connecting kids with nature, and then we'll have time for discussion and, and sharing, because this always brings up a lot from the folks in the audience. So uh, what does summer mean to you? I think of long, luxurious days. I think of family time I don't get in other times of the year. I think of a chance for new exploration and time in nature. And I think of the expansiveness of summer, the long days, a chance to do things we might not ordinarily do in other times of the year. And of course, summer is a time to play outside. So what happens when we get outside? Now, aside from having fun and creating memories and new experiences, there are a lot of tangible benefits, especially to children, that we might not ordinarily think about. So studies show that time in nature positively impacts every area of child development. Physical, psychological, intellectual, social, and emotional. And I'm going to take you through how it does some of those things. So let's take some of the psychological, social, and emotional benefits to time in nature. And you see it, here we have a visitor to the Discovery Museum enjoying nature and, and just having a wonderful time exploring. So kids in nature gain self-awareness. Think about it. it. It's the same way for us. Outdoor play allows us to get in touch with our own inner compasses. It helps with emotional regulation. It helps boost confidence. 
It increases flexibility, the ability to cooperate with others, and it helps improve resilience. Now, how does nature do all that? Well, I'm going to illustrate with a story about something called the forest kindergarten. Has anybody here heard of the forest kindergarten? Right? We were chatting about that, some of us. Well, these are preschools where the kids are outside all year round in any weather. And they happen predominantly in northern Europe, which is pretty interesting because it can be pretty cold in northern Europe. England, Denmark, Germany, Sweden, these are very big. They're just starting to come to the U.S. These are forest kindergartens. And the, basically how they work is there are no standard toys. The toys and all the play happen from items in nature. And they happen, you know, they play with sticks and stones and rocks and logs. And there was a study last year out of Wales, studied forest kindergartens. They took a traditional preschool. Half the kids went into the forest for 10 weeks, three hours a day for their preschool. The other half stayed inside to, in the traditional school. Now, the half that went to the forest, they were taught risk assessment, and they were given basic equipment for water and sand and mud play, like buckets, spades, ropes, shovels, and there was very little adult intervention. And then gradually, over the 10 weeks, the items were taken away, and the kids just played with the things that were outside, with the sticks and the logs and the uh, leaves and, and pebbles. So basically, they found that the kids use creative approaches to solving their problems. They work to resolve their conflicts. They demonstrated resilience when things didn't go their way. They were creative in using the items in nature. And they did all that more so than the kids who were back in the traditional preschool. And all the things I mentioned, the resilience and the creativity, these are all extremely important characteristics of successful children who later become successful adults. Now, some of you may have heard of the term soft skills. This is something that's coming up more and more in the workplace. And we're finding that workers are being let go when they are let go, not because of the inability to do their job, but because of the lack of these very soft skills, cooperation, teamwork, flexibility, conflict resolution. We're also hearing that creativity and innovation is lacking in the 21st century workplace. So all those qualities I mentioned are all qualities that children especially develop in nature. So another benefit of nature play you may not have thought of, kids are actually more inclusive in nature than on a traditional playground. And this is because in nature, what's valued is creativity, ability to cooperate, bringing fantasy play to the group, more so than sheer size and strength. So there is less bullying out in nature than on a traditional playground. All kinds of benefits happen when kids get out in nature. So still more benefits. There are benefits to academic play. And here's another great shot of folks in Lookout Cove right here at the museum. Uh, a study in Germany studied kids who had attended a forest kindergarten, and they found that they surpassed their peers in reading, math, knowledge of specific subjects, sports, art, music, motor skills. They were better at holding pencils and paintbrushes. They were curious. They were motivated. They were participatory. They were asking questions. And this is because nature largely offers lots of opportunities for play and exploration. There isn't just one way to play in nature. So now, numerous health benefits to playing in nature. And again, lots of studies on this. I'll just mention a couple. A uh, recent study out of Scotland shows that just a walk in the park, just a walk, lowers people's indicators of stress, lowers their heart rates, lowers their blood pressure, lowers their cortisol. Another study showed that attention deficit symptoms are lowered by just exposure to a park, just a walk, not even a long time spent in the park. Study out of Japan to bring another part of the world in. They're very interested there in something they call forest bathing, and they advocate it. They actually advocate that people go out in the woods and experience nature, experience forest bathing, and all the benefits that happen there. There's another study that shows that hospital patients actually uh, recover quicker if they have a view of nature out their window. They studied patients. Some had a view of nature out the window. Some had a view of a brick wall. And the ones that had the view of nature recovered faster, they required less painkillers, and they gave more positive evaluations of hospital staff. So all kinds of things are happening in nature that we don't even think of, we're not necessarily conscious of, uh, but it just works wonders. 
uh, children who play in nature are likely to be of a healthy weight. They're likely to build their motor skills and develop their physical confidence because they are learning to take some healthy risks. And the medical community is actually starting to recognize this. Some are starting to write park prescriptions. They're actually writing a prescription. You know, take a walk in the park and call me in the morning, basically. Um, so this is great. The doctors are catching on. So basically, time in nature gives us an opportunity to understand our ecosystem, our roles within it, to interact with others, our peers and our neighbors when we go outside and play in the parks and the playgrounds. And when we go outside and play in the parks and the playgrounds, we're also helping make our communities safer by populating them, by being the people out in the park. Uh, when the kids play outside, their play is more expansive. It's as if their imaginations grow to fit the area. Nature also allows kids to tell their own stories, really important. Fantasy play helps with all kinds of life skills, problem solving, time management, emotional skills, and very importantly, the ability to reason, the ability to consider one outcome over another. And some of the work that's being done here at the Center for Childhood Creativity is exploring and fostering and advocating just that kind of cutting edge research. So I urge you to visit their website and read more about the benefits of creativity and the ways we can better foster creativity in children, one of which is getting them outside. So likewise, nature encourages the open-ended play that I talked about. Unlike with a traditional toy, there isn't one way to play with a stick or a stream or a pebble. A log can be a race car, a set of rocks can be jewels. So nature allows us to use all five senses. It allows deep immersion in play. It leads to enhanced wonder and joy. And it helps foster playtime, downtime, and family time. So here's a quote from Dr. Kenneth Ginsberg. He was a speaker at an earlier Center for Childhood Creativity event this year. He wrote a book called Building Resilience in Children and Teens. He's just done fantastic pioneering work about the importance of playtime, downtime, and family time for early childhood. And he says, there are no more valuable means in promoting success and happiness in children than the tried, trusted, and traditional methods of play and family togetherness. So this is great news. If you're thinking of adding on one more extracurricular, you might reconsider it. You might think of the words of Dr. Ginsburg and others and just really consider the importance of playtime, downtime, and family time. Of course, outdoor play enhances all those things, and all those things are a byproduct of outdoor play. And yet, only 51% of preschoolers even play outside daily, and of those only uh, three percent of their day is spent on outdoor play and I think a lot of us would agree that that's just not not quite enough time and there are a number of factors about this uh, there are fears around safety uh, some of this is media driven some of it's legitimate but a lot of it um, is really drummed up and actually uh, there are stranger abductions have gone down steadily over the last 30 years. Um, a lot of our neighborhoods are, are very safe. There's a lot of fear of the unknown. People think nature, nature is dangerous. People think play equipment is dangerous. And they think the kids are safer indoors when we may actually be putting them at health risk by keeping them indoors and, and not exposing them to nature. There's a fear of dirt. And actually, um, aside from all the wonderful products that we have to clean our clothes now, uh, dirt has beneficial bacteria that has been found to elevate our moods, help our immune system fight disease, and is actually even being explored for a treatment for cancer. So think about that the next time maybe one of your buddy parents doesn't want the kids to get dirty. Think of all the benefits of dirt. Uh, kids are very busy. They're very overscheduled. They have half the free time that they did just 30 years ago. 40% of adults bring work home with them regularly. Everybody's busy, everybody's on multiple devices, everybody's a little too busy to promote play and family togetherness and outdoor time. Also, parents are worried about achievement. They're worried the kids aren't gonna get into a particular college, even when they're toddlers. And uh, the, actually, the opposite is true. You know, They don't value the play time and the time in nature and there are studies that are now showing that those are the things that are going to enhance the qualities that are going to make these kids successful, college applicants successful, employees. So if only we could just get that message out to more people. 
Um, a lot of people are afraid of the weather. Even though we have these forest kindergartens where the people are going out in northern Europe, a lot of people in America don't want to dress their kids appropriately. There are even preschools where the parents don't send the kids with coats so that the preschoolers will be kept inside. They won't have to go out to play. So obviously these people aren't valuing the outdoor time and the playtime as much as many of us are here in the room. So that's a barrier. Lack of outdoor spaces is a barrier. A lot of space is privatized. It's developed. A lot of people don't have the local woods or even the vacant lots that they may have played in 30 years ago. Only one in five can walk to a local park or playground. And kids have one-ninth the roaming space that they had 40 years ago. So kids are a little constricted, and there's also less outdoor play area for them to play in when they are going outside. So all these things, and of course the, the boogeyman in the room is electronic media. So does anybody want to take a guess as to how many hours the average child, age 8 to 18, spends in front of a screen per week? Now this is any screen, iPhone, iPad, TV, computer. How many hours a week would you say? Yes? 42. 42? Anyone have another guess? 50. Did I hear 50? It's actually 53. 53 hours a week. The average child, 8 to 18, is on electronic media. It's two hours a day for preschool children. And a lot of that is video games for the little ones. Um, but 53 hours a week. So think about that. That's more time than many of us are at our workplace. That's more time than the average child is at school. And that's time when they're not outside to play. So uh, kids are learning to play video games and work smartphones before they learn to tie their shoes. And one little sad coda is that children in New York, preschool children, are being taught how to skip. Again, you'd think skipping would be something that would come naturally, would be an outgrowth of playground and nature and outdoor play. And they're being taught to skip, not because it's a wonderful, joyful thing to do with their bodies. They're being taught to skip because it's a requirement for kindergarten readiness. So <laughs> along with having to... Right? Along with having to cut with scissors and know your shapes and your numbers and colors, these kids are being taught to skip. So I'm sure you would agree with me something is wrong with that picture. But there is good news, and that is that people all around the world are overcoming some of these barriers and they're getting outside no matter the circumstance and the weather. And we have folks here playing in Egypt near the pyramids. We have folks playing in England where it's definitely cold that day. And we have folks playing in a village in Indonesia probably a game that's been passed down through the generations, which is a really lovely thing. And now here in the Bay Area, we have beautiful nearby nature all around. We are so fortunate. Uh, each of these photos was taken right nearby. Um, one is at a farm in Petaluma. One is at Phoenix Lake in Central Marin. One is at Ring Mountain in Tiburon right here. One is at Camp Bothine in Fairfax. So all beautiful, accessible nature right nearby, and I'm going to talk about a lot of the opportunities we have for going out in our local nature. So there's no need to travel to a national park, there's no need to live on a farm to get out in nature. Uh, you can find or create nature where you are, even a small garden, a path, a plot of grass, all those things can provide wonder and play for children. So even though we have these beautiful natural places I'm sure you'll want to take advantage of, the smallest little area can provide wonder for children in nature as well. So of course here at the Discovery Museum, we have Lookout Cove. So if you've not been, do yourself a favor and head over to Lookout Cove. It's 2.5 acres of outdoor space just for interactive and exploratory learning. Really very exciting. So here we have children experimenting with water and rocks in the outdoor learning lab. They're sifting, they're sorting, they're experiencing, they're obviously cooperating, they're very engaged. We have children engaged in water play with items that represent local Bay Area habitat, starfish and fish and crabs, and they're playing in water, which is a really great medium for nature play. We have another boy playing in the mud area, super fun, making mud pies, and I'm going to talk more about that in a bit, having great sensory experiences. He's getting his healthy dose of bacteria. He's, uh, he, he's uh, also can garden and worm, co worm compost back there. Just really fun stuff to do for kids in the dirt and just fascinating ways to learn about our ecosystem and the cycles of nature. And the last group is inside Peekaboo Palace, which is an on-site willow structure. It's a unique environment created by artist Patrick Doherty. 
and it helps kids engage further with nature. It's fun. It's just fun to be in there. It's like a little fort, you know, and they're involved in very deep experimentation and observation. So all fun, and I have just more great photos of folks here at the, at the Discovery Museum having a wonderful time, all in the shadow of the Golden Gate Bridge, enjoying our natural and man-made beauty and iconography of the Bay Area. I can't think of a better place. So what are some ideas for experiencing nature's wonder where you are? Well, I've got a few. Uh, the first one is to visit a tide pool. I don't know how many of you have gone tide pooling. It's so much fun and it's so wondrous for people of any age to walk along the tide pools and explore the ocean's edge when the tide goes out. So all the creatures that are normally under sea, the starfish and the sea anemones and the urchins are revealed for you to see. And you just walk gingerly among them. You don't have to do any more than that. And you look and you explore. And we are so fortunate because what you really want to do when you go tide pooling is have a minus tide. So a tide that's represented as a number below the number zero. And we're going to have some spectacular minus tides coming up this Sunday through Thursday. And actually in your little resource packet, uh, there's a link to a tide table for San Francisco Bay. And you're going to want to always be consulting the tide table and look for those minus tides and get your family out there. There's great tide pooling here off Bolinas and Agate Beach. Mirror Beach right here has good tide pooling. Fitzgerald Marine Reserve in the peninsula, also really wonderful tide pooling. And I just highly recommend this as a fun activity to do with your family. Another really fun thing to do is watch a meteor shower. And uh, there are meteor showers every month, and they're often spectacular. But one of the best ones is the Perseid meteor shower. It happens every August. This year it's August 12th, and uh, that's the peak. And the beautiful thing about meteor showers is you need no special equipment. You just go outside and you look up. And if you should happen to see a shooting star, you know, you don't see one every time. Sometimes there's cloud cover. Sometimes there's a full moon. This August 12th, there's actually going to be a tiny crescent moon. So we're really lucky. We just have to hope for no fog and get out there and look for meteors. It's a wondrous thing to see a shooting star go across the sky. It's also really great to be outside with your family, enjoying nature, enjoying the stars, looking up and seeing all that wonder. So just highly recommend it. Another fun thing to do is keep a moon diary. That really helps kids keep in touch with the cycle of the moon and the earth and just keep that diary through all the phases of the moon. Go outside every night for a month, look up in the same spot, visit the moon and see how it's moving. And if your child does that, they'll probably never forget the phases of the moon and the wonder of that activity. Wildflower hunts, also really fun. It might be a little late in the season this year, but you may still be able to go to Ring Mountain, which we had a slide of earlier, and hunt for the mariposa lily, which is a rare, uh, it's the Tiburon mariposa lily, super rare flower that only comes out on that mountain in June. So we, you might be able to hunt for that, you know, get a good picture up, take it with you. One way to engage kids in a wildflower hunt is have them look for specific colors or specific uh, flowers with certain Le you know, number of leaves, five leaves or six leaves, or if you like, you can even, if you're enterprising, print out a picture of a certain flower that you know to be in a certain spot, and again, in your resources is a guide to find out which wildflowers are local to your region, and you can print out a, a flower on a card, and you can uh, tie it with string around a child's neck, punch two holes in it, and then they'll have their specific flower that they're hunting for, and sometimes having a focus like that on a hunt is really helpful for kids. It helps them focus. It helps them look around. It helps them really tune in to the wonder of nature. So well, I just love wildflowers, and I'm always um, inspired when they come back again every spring. Uh, other ideas for getting out and enjoying nature? Just play games. You know, a lot of us have forgotten the simple, fun childhood games. And have you noticed that so far everything I've mentioned has been free? You know, it's been free to participate, go out in nature and enjoy it. And that's the thing about playing games too. Now, uh, how many of these do you remember from your childhood? Remember Duck, Duck, Goose or Mother May I? These are really fun games. And I just talked to a group of grandparents. They were talking about Mumbledy Peg and Pitching Pennies and King of the Mountain. So I suggest if you have nearby grandparents or grandparents that you visit yearly, ask them for their games. What did they play in childhood? I bet their games look very different from your games and your kids' games. And if, you know, if they're healthy, get out and play with them. Uh, it's just super fun to go out in a park and play games. And uh, 
While I won't share the rules for all these games, I will share one really fun variation of tag. It's called blob tag. And the way you play is you start with an it, like most tags do, and then it has to tag somebody, but the difference is that new person doesn't become the it, but they join hands with the it, and now the two of them are a blob, and they are the it running around trying to tag people. So it's really pretty funny to see people holding hands and tagging. Now those two people, when they tag somebody, what happens? That third person joins the blob, okay? And the, so the blob can just get bigger and bigger, or if you have a big enough group, some people play that the blob breaks off four people, uh, once it becomes four, then they break off two and two, and then there are two blobs running around. And uh, so it sort of, it kind of gets us away from one person being isolated as it, if that's an issue. It's also just really good, goofy fun, and I'm a proponent of that. I just think the more fun running around we have out in nature and in our playgrounds and parks, the better. So I have a lot of ideas for other nature observations and games. One is to have a simple cloud race. When's the last time you just lay in the grass and looked up at the clouds? Probably been a while. Uh, so I suggest lay down in the grass, two or more people. Each one picks a cloud, and just, that's their cloud that they're going to root for, and watch to see which one moves across the sky quicker than the other. You know, it's kind of a good old slow activity that will really get you maybe dialed down a bit and tuned into nature and looking at the beautiful nature and the beautiful clouds. Another fun one to play is a name walk, and you can do that by having kids look for something on a walk that starts with the first letter of their name. And again, that's a way to really focus kids on an activity. You, know, you can't really take them out in nature and go, focus on nature. You know, it, it helps them to have something they're looking for, a scavenger hunt, a treasure hunt, is a really fun way to do that. And it, it brings funds to it and, and just gives them something to do while they're on their walk. And you have another little walk activity that's really fun on your handout. Another one using our, another sense is called listen, do, hear. And you lie down, this is popular, this lying down, Blind, and you blindfold everybody, and you listen for 10 seconds, 20 seconds, however long you determine. And everybody has to see how many different things they hear. And with small children, they can raise a hand and they can put up a finger for each sound that they hear, but it really tunes them into listening to nature, listening to all the various sounds. And I'll bet they and you will be surprised just how many sounds you hear from this simple activity in nature. Another fun one, this is an old uh, brownie scout game that I played as a kid and I played when I was a scout leader. It's called Kim's Game, and it's uh, just kind of a little memory game. You get 10 small items, and everyone has about, again, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, however you determine to look at the items. And these are little items found in nature, acorn, a leaf, a pebble. And again, it has the kids focus on these items. And then uh, you place a towel over them, and you say, now, how many can you remember? And you can either have them call out the ones they remember or have them write them down. But again, it's just kind of a little focus and memory game, something to do maybe for a little quiet time in nature, maybe a little downtime after an activity. So those are all great. Um, something else I'm a huge proponent of is getting in the garden. I think the garden just provides so much wonder for children. I think a lot of us forget just how much wonder there is to just planting a seed, watering it, caring for it, and seeing it sprout. I mean, that's just such a cool experience. I never tire of it, so I can imagine how it would be for children seeing it the first time. And you don't need a large space. I personally have a deck on a typical hillside home, and we grow lots of stuff up there. We've had lots of great garden experiences there, so no need to have a large space. Of course, you can come here and do worm composting and play in the garden and have a great time. So I have a couple of ideas for fun garden projects. One of my favorite is a sunflower house. And uh, you do this by planting sunflowers in the shape of a perimeter of a little house. It could be, I don't know, five feet by five feet, a little bigger. And don't forget to leave room for a door because when the sunflowers grow, they're going to grow really tall and kids are going to love growing, uh, going in there and playing and they could have tea parties, they could have, it's almost like a little fort, a little private spot to be inside the sunflower house. So super wondrous, fun, sunflowers are whimsical and pretty easy to grow anyway. And I do suggest plant a few different successions of sunflowers so that your house will be pretty long lasting. Just a really fun, whimsical thing to do. Another great thing to do is grow a pizza garden. Now most kids love pizza, right? 
So almost anything for the pizza, you know, except for the dough and the cheese, can be grown in your garden. You can grow basil, tomatoes, mushrooms, eggplant, pepper, oregano, zucchini, spinach, onions. Maybe I left something out. I don't know. But uh, So you want to get your, your pizza garden. You can grow it any shape you want, but you might want to grow it in the shape of a pizza if you have the space. And each little pizza-like piece, each little spoke, can be a different ingredient for your pizza. Super fun for kids. Everyone loves growing a pizza garden. And then, of course, when all the vegetables grow, you can harvest them, make your own dough, get some store-bought dough, and create a pizza with them, which is also just really, really fun for kids. Another fun thing to do is grow food for a pet. You know, just as it's fun to grow food for us, it's fun to grow food for a beloved pet. So you can grow catnip if you have a cat, dry it in the oven, tie it up in little netting, and your cat will just play for it for hours. And it's fun to know you grew that catnip for the cat. Likewise, if you have a, a rabbit or a hamster, you can grow carrots, you can grow greens. All kinds of things for a pet are really great to do. Um, there's just so many activities that I recommend in the garden. Um, another one is to grow a habitat garden. And again, we have information about that on your handout too. Now, a habitat garden is very simple. Basically, you allow kids to attract and observe animals by providing plants that provide food, and then you provide water and shelter and a place for them to lay their eggs. That's it. And on your resource sheet is a, a guide from National Wildlife Federation about how to create a habitat garden, all the information you need to do it. Um, it can be as easy as hanging up a bird feeder and watching which birds come to feed at it, which again is a great source of wonder and fascination for kids to observe birds and observe nature. You can make a bird feeder out of a milk carton or a pine cone, or you can even make a bird feeder out of a toilet paper tube. It's super easy. You spread some vegetable shortening on, and then you uh, put some bird seed out in a pie tin. You roll the uh, shortening covered toilet paper tube in the bird seed, and voila, bird feeder, punch two holes on the top of the toilet paper tube, hang them with yarn. We've done this on our deck. We have so many birds come. It's amazing. They love. They love the feeder, they love the seed, and they love to come eat. And so we know we're helping birds, we're helping wildlife, and it's also just so much fun to watch who comes. So I also have some resources about identifying different birds. So you know who's coming to your garden. That can be really fun too. Uh, you can also plant a plant that attracts butterflies. You have some wildflower seeds in your pack. And just watching who comes to the garden is of endless fascination. Butterflies are beautiful. And um, that's just really, really fun for kids. Just that little extra to plant something that will attract them and, and help them uh, create new butterflies. So uh, also there's a Butterflies and Blooms show at the Conservatory of Flowers in Golden Gate Park, something you might want to uh, take your family to and enjoy. Now, if you want to take this to a whole other level, you might consider becoming what's called a citizen scientist. And there are citizen scientist programs where anybody of any age can help researchers monitor various aspects of nature. And they do that by observing nature right in their own backyards. And there's a lot of these great projects. I've done a lot of them with my family. We love them. One coming up in July is called the Great Sunflower Project. So if you were to plant sunflowers for your playhouse or otherwise, you could participate in this. You, you don't need many. We did it with literally two sunflowers. And you see which, how many bees come in a set number of time on a set day, and then you report back to a website. That's the Great Sunflower Project. It's out of San Francisco State. And by doing so, you're observing nature. You're showing your child things about the cycle of nature and feeding. And you're actually helping scientists because they're wondering about the bee population. Many other projects, one of them is Monarch Watch, same thing. You're helping observe monarchs in their, in their cycles of migration, which is really exciting. There are weather observer programs. There are multiple backyard bird counts that help the Audubon Society, the Cornell Ornithology Lab. Uh, there's another one called Project Bud Burst, in which you are helping uh, observers of wildflowers by noting where different wildflowers are coming up. And there's another one called Meteor Watch. So if you have a child that's maybe a little interested in technology or interested in tracking meteors when you go out to look at the Perseid meteor shower or another, get them involved in Meteor Watch. You actually just plug, it's an app, and you plug right into NASA and you're letting them know how often the meteors are coming and where. So it's just, it can be very exciting for kids to help 
know that they're helping scientists and researchers and also to tune them into the fact of what some of these scientists do, what they're observing and what it means to observe and to focus in nature. So just super fun. Uh, I have some basic tips for gardening with kids that I like to share with people. Um, one of them is to keep the chores manageable, both for yourself and for your children. So in other words, don't try to plant a whole giant garden in a weekend. Everyone's just going to burn out on the whole project. Um, the other thing is for kids, give them a tiny part of the project, something that they can do. When my daughter was really little, we had her check who was wet and who was dry. And she would just poke a finger into the various plants and see which plants needed to be watered. You know, that's simple. That was her job. And she had a lot of ownership of that job. Uh, and then that's another thing is to give kids ownership of the project and the area. So maybe one, one task specifically belongs to a child. Maybe it's checking who's wet. Maybe it's watering. Um, oftentimes kids love to choose plants. So maybe if they have a specific favorite flower or plant, and then that's theirs to take care of. Maybe a child will have a specific area of a garden, and that's theirs to take care of, and you can mark it off. Um, I have a little painted rock project on your handout. Maybe they want to paint rocks, and those rocks are in their area of the garden to designate theirs. But there is something about having ownership of the project, ownership of the space that really helps kids. Um, I also recommending, recommend planting some plants that are pretty easy to plant, maybe some big seeds, and grow quickly. And some of those I found are nasturtium, pea, sunflowers, and beans. And I'm sure there's more, and you can research many more, but that might help ensure success in the garden. Of course, you're going to provide opportunities for learning and wonder, and we went through a lot of those, whether it's through a butterfly-attracting plant or just watching the magic of a seed come up. Experiment, maybe plant a plant in two different spaces, sun, shade, you know, just to see what happens, just to show children that different conditions result in different kind of plants. You know, not everybody wants to plant flowers and grow flowers. A lot of people just want to get in the yard and dig and have fun in the dirt. So maybe have a dirt area, maybe have a sand area, maybe have a play area or a worm compost area that is free, you know, for kids to just go in and play in and get their hands dirty and have a good time. Maybe that's going to be the best benefit of the garden for some children. And of course, you want to harvest the fruits of what you grow. And we shared a little bit about that when we talked about harvesting food for a pet. Uh, you also want to harvest food for your family. And if you're growing tomatoes and if you're doing the pizza garden, of course, you might make some tomato sauce and pizza ingredients. I'm going to talk about jam in a moment. So if you're growing fruit, of course, there's all the fun summer desserts that you can make with fruit. Jam is a wonderful activity to do with kids, a little bit of kitchen science. And of course, jam is just so yummy. We enjoy making that. Um, I suggest having a farmer's market or a swap. Some kids are really proud of what they grew and they want to take it down to a neighborhood and make a stand and have a little farmer's market. Or they might want to swap veggies with neighbors. Maybe you're growing something, a neighbor is growing something else. There's the Marin Community Garden Network. I don't know how many folks know about that. But they actually sponsor garden swaps in lots of neighborhoods around Marin. And it's really fun. It's a great way to know your neighbors. Um, our local one in our neighborhood is Saturday mornings at 10. And you go down to a spot and you chat about what you're growing and you chat about other neighborhood news. It's a chance just to meet people and, and talk about what's growing and share what you've grown and have some pride about that. So kids might enjoy doing that. Uh, another really interesting and simple thing to do is just make sun tea. You know, we don't think of this, but instead of boiling the water for tea on a hot, hot day, um, just put the tea and the water outside, and uh, you're going to want to enjoy that. If you're growing mint or lemon verbena or chamomile, you can, of course, use that in your tea. And uh, that's just a really fun and simple thing to do. Sometimes these simple things to do, we overlook them. Uh, you know, they're not elaborate, they're not fabulous, but often kids will have the, just the best memories from the most simple activities like that. Another fun one to do is save seeds, and I have the nasturtium seeds up here. Um, really big, really easy to save. They pretty much drop off the plant when it's that time in the cycle. And so for kids to save seeds, you just take them off, you, you dry them really out in the open air, and then you put them in an envelope and you plant them again the next year. And nasturtium are relatively foolproof. And so when they come up, they teach the kids so much that plant becomes seed becomes plant. 
Um, they really learn a lot about the cycle of life just from doing this simple exercise. So you can tell I'm a big nasturtium fan, and I really recommend um, doing that with your kids. Uh, another fun thing to do is make potpourri. And you can uh, dry flowers that you grow. You uh, just put it in a little circle of netting, tie up the netting, and you can use it for gifts, Mother's Day gifts, teacher's gifts. You can scent drawers with it. Just another really fun way to make the items in the garden last longer and to have fun in the garden and make gifts out of the garden. So that's all great. I had mentioned the jam. And uh, this is my favorite recipe for jam. It's very easy. And uh, I also recommend that if you like to use a little less sugar than a traditional jam calls for, look into something called low methoxyl pectin. Uh, and it's, it's on your sheet. It's Pomona's pectin is the brand I know that's usually in stores that's low methoxyl. And you actually need about a quarter of the sugar that you use in traditional jam. So if you're looking for an alternative sweetener or just to use a little less sugar, I recommend doing that. The jam still comes out great. And jam is something I started making with my daughter when she was really little, and we still do it. It's just a fun kitchen project. If you've grown the fruit for the project, all the better. Maybe you go out to a berry farm and pick berries. Maybe you buy them at a market. But it's just a fun way, again, to make something from the fruit and to show kids where, where jam comes from and how to make it. And there's a lot of stirring and, and pouring, and there are things really that even a pretty small child can help with. So that's great. They're contributing in the kitchen and you have a fun family hobby that you can do together. And then the jam tastes fabulous. Your jam in the winter will remind you of the summer in which you picked the fruit and made the jam. So I'm an advocate there. Um, another fun way to get out in nature is to do arts and crafts. Even things that you would ordinarily do inside, take them outside and enjoy beautiful nature while you do them. Nature can be your inspiration and nature can be your materials. So lots of fun outdoor crafts to do include Finger painting. Um, there's actually a homemade finger paint recipe in my book that you can make with cornstarch, sugar, water, and dishwashing liquid. So if you want to make your own, that's really fun to get out and do it. Purchase finger paints or any paints and just get outside and have fun. Uh, the other is the paper plate garden hat, uh, which my daughter is wearing there. Super easy to make. You get a standard paper plate, fold it in half, cut a circle out so that you have a circle that sits on top of the head, and then you can just decorate it with items uh, of your choice. You know, they can be items inspired in nature. I think there are some leaves and flowers and birds and other things on her hat. So just fun to make a nature project while you're out in nature. Another fun thing to do is coffee filter butterflies. Very easy to do with really young children. You just kind of flatten the coffee filter and you paint on it with food coloring or paint, and the coloring, because of the filter material, kind of spreads all over it, and they, they're really pretty. So once your paint dries, you want to fold the coffee filter like an accordion, and then you want to cinch it with a pipe cleaner. And then when you spread out uh, the two sides of the filter, it looks like little butterfly wings. And so just a really sweet, easy, inexpensive project that you can do in your backyard tomorrow. So I'm a, really a big advocate of those. And then you see, of course, in the slide, a child is actually using a flower as a paintbrush. He's painting with nature, not just in nature, um, which is a really cool thing to do, um, to think of natural materials, to think of using them in ways that we might not ordinarily think of. And there's something tactile and really enjoyable about actually painting with nature in the way that he is. Um, so still more nature crafts that I advocate for are uh, something called a nature bracelet. Again, super simple and really fun for kids. You basically take masking tape and you put it sticky side out on a child's wrist and then they walk around and they look around in nature for things already on the ground. We don't pick things in nature, but things on the ground that might go on the bracelet, like little leaves and pebbles and petals and acorns. And uh, when they're done with their walk, usually kids are really proud to come back and show you their nature bracelet that they created. Again, just a really fun, easy, inexpensive activity that helps them focus and, and gives them something fun to do in nature and gives you a little activity to, to promote in nature. Likewise, found item mosaics. Same thing. Get little items and you can glue them onto a piece of cardboard or another uh, material. And you have beautiful mosaics of things found in nature. 
pine cone folk are really fun to make when we have the pine cones in the fall. Really easy too, you have a pine cone, they can have a little acorn head, they can have pipe cleaner arms and you can paint and glitter and otherwise decorate them. You can make little clothes for them. Uh, you can make clothes out of nature or clothes out of fabric. So just super fun and easy ways to create with materials in nature. Uh, flower presses are fun. If you want to preserve the flowers, you could do it by having two pieces of particle board and just bungee them together and then you want to have paper on each side of your leaf or your flower that you're pressing so it dries nicely. You can press flowers and leaves inside of phone books, but uh, I, be warned because we're a family that is always looking in the phone book and then flowers and leaves are falling out, so I guess you have to go back and retrieve them when you're done with the project. But um, those work certainly for flattening flowers and then you can do fun things with your flowers and your leaves. You can make placemats, you can make bookmarks by putting them between two pieces of wax paper or putting them between wax and fabric and preserving them. Just really fun. Another fun thing to do is leaf printing. You just want to do as they're doing in the picture, you paint on the underside of the leaf where all the texture is and then you have to really carefully flip the leaf over so that the paint and the impression of the leaf goes on your paper or your fabric. And if you do a t-shirt, I would just recommend stretching it over a piece of cardboard and taping the shirt to the back of the cardboard so that you have a really flat surface. And those are fun. I know kids that have done leaf print t-shirts and they're really proud to wear them afterward. They're proud to have a product of their fun time and their observation in nature. So just really, again, easy, easy activities that I recommend, ways to get out in nature. Another one is to make nature potions and have fun in mud pie kitchens. And we know kids have fun in the mud pie kitchen here at the museum. And a way to imitate that at home uh, is just very simple, very magical activity for kids. You can use things like muffin tins, ice cube trays, anything from your kitchen. Pans, cups and bowls and stirrers, herbs, flowers, petals, leaves, glitter, sand, bits of paint, and you just want to create, you know, you just want to put them all out and kids will create with them. They'll make all kinds of magical potions. There's something, there's something about that word, potions, that uh, it just stirs something in kids, I think. It stirs the wonder and the idea of creation. What are they making? And their imagination is actually leading them to whatever it is they're making. You know, if you just provide a few simple materials out in nature, they will come up with something. They will create in their mud pie kitchen. Um, sometimes also we add, uh, you know, plastic plates and pretend food to the mud pie kitchen. And kids will just, you know, they'll pretend to play store, they'll pretend to play kitchen, they'll pretend to play whatever they want to play um, because it is open-ended and they're really being inspired to play out in nature. Another super fun thing to do is to blow bubbles. I know we have a lot of bubble fans in the audience. And uh, great news, I just found out that the Discovery Museum is having a bubble day here on June 15th. So if you want to apply some of the ideas that I'm going to share with you, you might want to come here and just have a lot of fun with bubbles on that day. Um, so we often make bubbles at our house. It's super easy. I'm going to share my recipe in a moment, and it's also on your handout. And you can leave a bucket of bubble solution out for weeks. It doesn't go bad and, and it's just there for magical enjoyment. Kids will come up and if you have a wand, and I'll share how to make a wand, kids will come up and enjoy making bubbles and enjoy playing with it just constantly. So that's just a really super fun thing to do. So uh, here's my recipe and there is a link to it online. Six cups water, two cups Dawn. For some reason that is the detergent that works the best. I'm not uh, sponsored by Dawn or anything, but it works the best and uh, three cups caro syrup. So you, do, you combine those, you want to stir gently, you want to add, uh, add your water before you add the detergent. We've learned that the hard way. If you add the detergent, it foams up really far and you don't get to play with your bubbles for kind of a long time. So um, other secrets of the bubble makers are uh, you want a cool day, you don't want too much wind. If it's a windy day but you really want to make bubbles, try to seek some shelter and go uh, create the bubble solution there. And you have to wait about half an hour till it's ready to be used. Um, you also don't want to have dry surfaces. Dry is the enemy of the bubble. So you want to have wet hands, and so you want to touch, try to touch the bubble with your wet hands. And that gets into the experimenting part. So have kids experiment. You uh, experiment by sticking a wet hand through a bubble and see if the bubble stays intact or changes shape. Uh, you can make a flat window pane with a bubble. If your 
bubble bucket is big enough, you dip the window pane in there and you lift it up and you have a bubble window. That's super fun. Uh, you want to look around the house for interesting things that will make interesting bubbles. So maybe the basket from a carton of strawberries, maybe a six-pack ring from sodas, or maybe you make your own bubble wand by uh, unfolding a coat hanger, and you can make a really giant wand that way. Take a second coat hanger or another kind of stick or dowel and attach it for a rod, and that is your giant wand, and it will make giant bubbles because this solution is thick and really good for giant bubbles. And that's just so much fun for kids to wave bubbles around and have fun with it. They'll do it for hours. So highly recommend bubbles as a way to have fun, a way to experiment with a little science, and a way to get out in nature or in the backyard or in a playground and have a good time. So I've touched a little bit on this idea, something called loose parts. And it's something that's very big in the museum. And if you apply the theory of loose parts in your home, you might be on your way to creating a Discovery Museum experience at home. So the idea of loose parts is that they can be played any way kids want. There's no one way to play with them. So this is very open-ended play. It fosters creative play. It fosters child-centered play. Um, so basically, there's no one way to play with them, and you can combine materials to create other things. So basically, a few things to keep in mind if you want to have a loose parts-friendly environment is have some varied terrain maybe some lock, uh, logs or planks or stumps, even a cardboard box. I mean, not everything has to be from nature if you're playing in nature. Uh, garden items, a digging pit. And then you want to think about all kinds of things that you're going to use in addition, like pine cones, blocks, um, things for nature exploration, like binoculars. You want things for water and sand play, like buckets and spades and ropes and watering cans and pans. You want things for kitchen and store play, which I touched on a little earlier, like plastic dishes or pie tins or pots and pans. Kids love playing with all that stuff in nature. And loose parts can be played any way the children choose, and they're going to choose all kinds of ways that will really surprise you. They can be adapted and manipulated. The creativity of the children is activated. Their imagination is activated. And often, the interesting thing is, children given the choice will choose the loose part over the conventional toy. And this actually happened at the Children's Discovery Museum in San Jose. They were setting up an exhibit, and uh, the, the exhibit designer actually just tossed a cardboard box that he was finished with, that something had come in, into the exhibit. Well, the kids wanted to play with the box more than they wanted to play with the toys. So much so that the museum actually created an event called Box City where kids came and got to play with boxes and got to use them all different ways. So just another uh, reason that loose parts work so well. And an, an activity that's going to happen at the museum on July 27th is a Create with Nature event with my friend Zach Pine. And that really is a, a great event for playing with nature materials, for experiencing the loose parts and the creativity that can happen with nature. And I know we're running a little short on time, so I'm going to wrap up and just suggest that people camp in the backyard. Another fun, super simple activity that kids really enjoy. They have a lot of great memories from camping in the backyard. I suggest you try to remember all the fun things you did when you were a kid and pass them on to your child. You can cook in an outdoor box oven really quite easily. You can uh, make s'mores. You can play flashlight tag. You can sing around the campfire. There's something very magical that happens. Uh, around a campfire when you get people singing and telling stories. And you can stargaze. Don't forget to just look up at the stars. It doesn't have to be a meteor shower night. Look up at the stars and have fabulous wonder. Uh, and then I also recommend that uh, this is the nonprofit where I work, the Children and Nature Network. Sometimes people don't want to go out in nature with their own family. Sometimes they don't want to take a hike. They want to have a family to do something with. So I suggest if there is a barrier to getting out in some part of nature, find a buddy. Find somebody to do it with. At the Children and Nature Network, we have what's called Family Nature Clubs. And you can go online in your resource handout 
and uh, look at the directory and find a nature club in the area. And these are people who are already going out in nature at designated times and would welcome you to come join them on a hike. There's one family nature club in San Diego that has 900 members. So these are very popular. You know, it's a great way to get outside in a group. People really enjoy the camaraderie. Kids enjoy the friendships of getting out in nature. So I urge you to find out more about family nature clubs and if you're really motivated to start one. It takes somebody to start one and be the dedicated person to do that. Uh, treasure your memories. A lot of people have a wonder bowl in their house. These are shells that we collected at Stinson Beach one summer. So enjoy your memories. Treasure them. You can display them by the season. Uh, you can keep a scrapbook. A lot of kids like to do sound recording, maybe of birds, maybe like to do digital photography of things in nature. So if you have somebody that's oriented to keeping a record of that, do treasure your memories. Um, I just want to thank the people who were kind enough to provide photos for the show. And I want to share the resources that you do have in your handout so that you didn't have to write down everything tonight. I recommend that you go to these and find out more about all the different things that I talked about and make use of your nearby nature, of the museum, and your own backyard. And I truly appreciate you coming tonight. Thank you.